Alright folks, welcome to Besides the Norm. I'm Scuba, we're here with Craig. How you doing, man? Same as every time you ask, man. <laughs> it's always good, it's always good. So, we have a guest in today. Let me get to my documentation. Right, okay, uh, Carlo Millet. Oh, we'll Millet. start again with there. Yeah. Carlo... He's literally on his... <laughs> <laughs> literally on his <laughs> website. Carlo is easy. <laughs> Carlo Morelli is a senior lecturer in business and economic history. He graduated at Queen Mary and Westfield College, University of London in 1992 and undertook a PhD at the London School of Economics, which was awarded in 1997. Before coming to Dundee, Carlo was a lecturer in economic history at Warwick University. And he's also, weirdly enough, here. So love, how are you doing, Carlo? <laughs> I'm going to I'm I'm put in... And love the fact that you wrote none of that down, you just read it off the website. I know, well, uh, I think that's probably the perfect you read thing. To, at did. least learn something about the guy. Yeah. Well, that's you know, just like, oh, he's got a done deal lecture. I did know some stuff, but I'm, this thing, I'm always afraid in case I mess someone up and then I look entirely so you stupid. You the guy's biography. Exactly, so I think that was probably <laughs> the perfect way to do that, yeah. So, how did you feel about that? <laughs> if I didn't realise you were going to read it, I'd have taken it down off the web. <laughs> <laughs> then I'd have been proper stumped. But Sorry, hey. I learned that. Didn't worry. Yeah. I can my stuff. <laughs> it's easy to lie when you don't need to prove it. Well, there you go. There you go. Yeah. Right. So, so uh, now that I've been exposed for a cheat. <laughs> uh, welcome, Carlo. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for asking me to do this. <laughs> so, when we first heard about you, we thought we automatically, maybe offensively, assumed that you were just a guy who knew economics. We didn't quite realise how officially educated you were on the mm-hmm. subject. Cause we, we spoke to Bill Mayer beforehand, yeah, yeah. and uh, it was him that got in touch with you. Yeah. And we assumed, obviously, you were an economic uh, guy for the side of them. Of course, he did say and, uh, Dr. Carlo, so that instantly <coughs> was like, fucking hell. <laughs> <laughs> and then when we checked up, you were like, we realised you were an actual lecturer and stuff yeah, like yeah. that. So I was like, right, Jesus. This was after we spoke to you, so yeah. when oh. we were speaking to you, we had no idea who you were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that was... That was fun. Good. But this is it. This is going to be pretty cool. And as I say, usually when we get people in, we try to kind of not patronise people, but kind of simplify where you can. And I know economics is like a really, really hard thing for a lot of people to grasp, even politicians like we just discussed beforehand. Um, so we'd like to talk about that. But first, um, usually when we have people in, we kind of go into the backstory, what kind of made you get into this kind of line of work. Yeah. So, okay. uh, no, sorry, you need to turn down your mic. What's my backstory? Um, right, well, backstory. Um, well, I was born and brought up in London. I uh, went to a comprehensive school, left school at 16, went to an FE college, did some A-levels, went to work. Um, I got involved in politics, socialist politics, from about 18. Partly because around that time, that was when uh, a group of neo-Nazis called the National Front was starting to emerge. So I got involved in Mm -hmm. anti-racism. Fast forward a bit. Um, When they decided to introduce um, fees and get rid of grants, I knew if I didn't go go to university then, I never would. So I packed in my job and went to university as a mature student. I was in uh, Queen Mary in London doing a modern history degree. And um, at the end of that, I was toying with what I was going to do. And um, one thing that came up was applying for funding to do a PhD, because there's a government body called the ESRC, Economic and Social Research Council, which fund PhDs. So I put in an application for that with no expectation of getting that. (laughs) <laughs> and they awarded me this funding for three years. So I thought, well, go off and do that. That sounds like a good idea, Fund mm. it, do a PhD. After about two years, it's quite funny, after about two years of this, I realised you could get a job with this. <laughs> no idea at the time. And long and short of it, long story short, eventually I ended up as a lecturer. Um, first in Warwick and then this job in Dundee came up. Mm. Um and that was the story, really. So I left London and came up here about uh, 19 years ago now. Mm. You, you've got a couple of qualifications in economics. None. No. None. Oh. I've got a modern history degree and a PhD in economic history. Oh, economic oh. history. Right. <laughs> economic history is really what I do. Yeah. Mm. yeah. yeah. That's economics, though. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. Mm. In some ways. 
Yeah. That's it. So, uh, what what you've been doing since then? Uh, it's just uh, it's simply been sort of lecturing in Dundee that you've been. Making yeah, I'm involved in my trade union, so I'm on the national executive of my union now. That's the University Colleges Union. I'm involved in socialist politics. I'm involved in the socialist workers' party, um, and then I'm a lecturer, and I'm involved in different campaign groups in Fife and in Dundee. Mm-hmm. Uh, various things depending on what's happening. What, what what kind of campaign groups are these then? Well, um, well, in five people will know of the bedroom tax campaign um, and the anti-racism campaign around the, sh- the killing of Sheikh Bay uh, by the police in Kakadi last year. In fact, it's a year next week since he was the killed. Lobby, aye, aye. Um, then there's the what else? The the campaign against cuts that are going on. So um, and one of the things I'm so what, one of the things I'm interested in is anti poverty and welfare. So a lot of my research is based around anti poverty measures, and essentially it's about working with groups like the Child Poverty Action Group, Poverty Alliance, and other campaign groups about how you can address uh, household poverty in Scotland. So that's mm-hmm. partly what my research area is. So, for example, we were talking earlier about free school meals. Mm-hmm. I was involved in doing the research, a lot of the research, supporting the camp, the case for universal free school meals. Uh, some of the most recent stuff I've been doing, which is the opposite end of the age spectrum, is been looking at funeral poverty. And one of the things that's happening is that low-income households facing a funeral are being driven into pretty high levels of poverty because there's little access to funding to support the costs of uh, of a funeral so people are relying upon friends families collections and going into debt to pay for a funeral that has come might have come out of the blue and um, for a low-income household it's uh, it's a massive problem mm-hmm. yeah funerals are pretty expensive thing well, they're really expensive i think people kind of underestimate how expensive a funeral yeah. can be and, sometimes and the ability to get a funeral is determined by small number of companies that run the funeral business so if you and of course people don't know their legal rights so if you have to go organize a funeral you end up with one of these companies who can then charge the earth for you Um, so people don't know what they have what they don't know the costs they don't know what's the legal requirement what's optional and they end up paying a huge price for a funeral when they've got no money so mm. you know it's a, it's a real issue and it's going to become a bigger issue in in Scotland over the, over the next few months and years mm. anyway so that's that's kind of what I'm up to but one thing you were saying earlier about economics being difficult mm-hmm. um I partially disagree with that I think it's made difficult precisely because well the way I put it is some people need jobs so they invent language to create a job for themselves which yep. I'm not against people creating jobs that's, that's exactly enough. my thinking as well um, but I think ordinary people can understand economics very very well mm-hmm. you've got a question on this well that's a, a, a lot of the problem with trying to understand economics is a lot of people don't take the time to learn kind of certain things and I, I suppose with this we could kind of explain some of the things that people like could use to sort of learn a wee bit more about it as well, so it'd be pretty helpful. What, what were you saying? You you were talking about this Joe Rogan thing. Oh yeah, basically there's a which I am starting to think you've maybe missed mixed up a different word right. because the definition seemed to be quite easy when you read. Oh yeah, well, this is a Joe Rogan does a podcast. I don't know if you've heard the Joe Rogan. No. He's no. a quite an open guy, isn't he? Can it like a does talks a lot about kind of drug reform and kind of changing the world okay. a lot of kind of all that stuff gets loads of different guests and he's mainly a comedian but he gets loads of kind of different guests from totally different sides <laughs> sides and arguments and stuff like that and they, they were talking about derivatives now yeah. uh, Joe Rogan uh, had this explained to him from an economics advisor of, of some sort of some sense and uh, Joe Rogan was like, still struggled with it and we looked at the definition yesterday and struggled for a few minutes, but eventually clicked as to what a derivative was. Ah. So, um, could, could you explain what a derivative is? <laughs> okay. do, or do you yeah, know? Or, no, well, do you know the, what a derivative yeah, is? Yeah, well, well, I don't know. I'm not sure. There's, well, there's, there's, <laughs> there's, no, there's more than one thing covered oh. by a derivative. That's, that's the reality of it. But right. all of them are the same thing. Okay? Mm. All of the, the financialization approach is about taking something, whatever it is, this cup in front of me, that pen, okay, mm-hmm. um, and saying that you can sell 
the value, the cost, the mm. price of that cup, that pen to somebody else. In other words, you can financialize it and, and then you can transfer that ownership to anyone without mm. passing the actual thing to the person. So, so the obvious thing, case in point, you, know, you, you, you take out a debt, a credit card debt, a mortgage, a car loan, whatever it is. You live in the house, you have the car or whatever you bought with the loan. So you've got the object, but the loan you've still got to pay back. Mm. That's the thing that can be financialized and can be sold on. So you take out your credit card or your bank loan or whatever, your mortgage with this company, but without asking you, without you knowing anything about it, without telling you, that debt is sold on to somebody else or to somebody else or to somebody else. And it can be sold as many times as you like. That debt is the derivative. It's financialized, so it's portable. It can be sold and bought. Mm -hmm. And you have no idea, the person who actually has the debt, who's living in the house, who's bought the car, whatever, has no idea or control over what's happening with that debt. And why does that matter? It matters because there can be a, a profits, there can be a market made out of this selling and buying of debt. So the reason why the subprime market all blew up wasn't because there were mortgages sold to people who were poor and couldn't afford to pay the mortgage back. I mean, that was true, mm. but they've been doing that for <coughs> generations. <laughs> what's, what's new about that? <laughs> you know, what was, what was different was that they were selling these things on as debts to other companies and selling them on and on and on. They were called packaging them up into these derivatives, mm. uh, claiming that they were going to get income from these debts, i.e. people paying their mortgages. And, of course, when they didn't, when they couldn't afford to pay the mortgages then these derivatives weren't paying out what they were supposed to be paying out. And the people who were holding them then suddenly found they had no income, but they now bought this debt and they couldn't then afford to pay off the debt. The bank goes bust. But that bank that goes bust wasn't actually the bank that sold the original mortgage in the first place. They'd cleverly taken out the mor sold the mortgage to you, me or whoever, sold on their debt, so they were left smiling, um, <laughs> It's, they've got the, the money from selling the product, the debt, a commission, and then they would sold the debt itself and got the money for the debt from the other bank or whoever it was that bought it. They were sitting there happily as Lowry. The person who had the mortgage or had the debt couldn't afford to pay it, and they, they had the house repossessed, the car repossessed or whatever, they're made bankrupt. And the, whoever it is that's left holding the debt at the end of the day then also gets, uh, goes bust. And who's that? Well, it wasn't the banks. It was your, my, somebody else's pension fund, your, my government, your, mm. my something or other. It was passed back to ordinary people in one shape or form. Um, and the banks then could uh, make huge profits. Mm. And, the, and so that's, that's what a derivative is. It's a way of offloading a debt to somebody else. And so yeah. I was wrong. Yep. <laughs> well, it depends what you said, but well, you probably what, weren't. What was your on. explanation? Uh, well, the definition from Google said that it was a product or something that was derived as value from the value of something else. That's so right. I it's thought exactly right. petrol right. is a derivative of oil. No, 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 no. The petrol is the product. The, whoever's selling the petrol, you know, the, the oil company. Mm -hmm can commercialise that. They can, it, the, the value of that, you know, they, they sell a tanker load of petrol to a petrol station or something, and the petrol station is then expected to pay for that petrol to the oil company. Before they do that, the oil company could sell on that debt to somebody else. So that's what making a product of something else, of the value of it, um, that's what they're selling. They're selling a future um, income stream or future it's like an IOU you know right. I take an IOU out from you and I can pass it to somebody else or to somebody else mm -hmm. that's what a derivative is right so it's not like a, like a kind of like a, a forecast like a, it's, yeah. it's not a, a, a yeah. definite sort of thing so it's just oh. yeah so it's so it's by the name of futures and things like that mm -hmm. you're buying a, you know you're buying the right to something in the future that's essentially what you're doing yeah. And that could go wrong sometimes. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, exactly. well would you? Exactly. That is, is, could, uh, exactly. That's say uh, the housing collapse in America. It was kind of. I think that's you kind of touched yeah. on that a wee bit there. 
But uh, the housing collapse in America was a uh, was caused because of that. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of the kind of well, 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 yes, that was the spark of it. That's yeah. right. But behind it was something else, and mm. this is this is one of the reasons why I'm a socialist and I'm interested in economics. Mm. Yeah, the housing collapse happened because these derivatives didn't pay out, mm. or the or the the mortgages weren't getting paid because the debts were too high. That that's not new. We've had people not paying mortgages and losing their job, losing their house, mm. and repossession for since houses have been bought and mortgages have had been had. So that's that's not new. Mm. What was new was the fact that these things were now bundled up, was the phrase they used, into derivatives, and those derivatives were then sold. And they were sold, they, you know, they, they, again, some, somebody comes in and says, oh, this, this is worth something, you know, a credit rating agency, and they would say, this is a AAA rated debt, and therefore it's worth a lot of money because you're going to guarantee getting the payment back rather than some dodgy debt, and therefore you pay less for it. So these <laughs> these debts, these AAA rated debts, were then sold to mm-hmm. various people for a lot of, you know, obviously a higher value than than dodgy debt would be paid it would be worth. Um, and when that when these mortgages didn't get paid, these dodgy, these debts then became dodgy and didn't get paid. That's true. Mm-hmm. Now what was new is that that derivative was new, and the and the crisis then emerged in the financial sector because this is all fictitious money that was going on. But and this is this is why the link to economics matters, and why Marx's ideas about what he calls the tendency of the rate of profit to fall matters. The crisis in the financial sector was new, but it wasn't the first time there'd been a, a crisis in the economy. Mm. What had happened is the crisis in the real economy had happened multiple times, but the last, well, the real time it happened was in the late sixties, early seventies. There was a massive crisis. That's when unemployment in Britain went back up to a million for the first time since the Second World War. That's when mass unemployment returned back to Britain Mm -hmm. and elsewhere. And what happened is because firms didn't think they could make profits in the real economy, they stopped investing in the real economy and then started investing in the financial sector of the economy. And because they started investing in that area, deregulation of banks came in, these debts started to be valuable and the prices of them started to go up. So the same tendency of the rate of profit to fall that had emerged already in the real economy then started to emerge in the financial sector. Mm. And that's what we saw with the crash in, in uh, 2007. I, I watched a, a film about it. They, they were <clears throat> there was a few guys that had actually forecasted that that was going to happen, the actual collapse was going to happen. So they actually bidded... I, I don't know how uh, how exactly that worked, but they put money into it collapsing or so. Is that is that yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, is that right? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. That's what uh, George saw. <laughs> this is why he's here to. to of course, yeah, you yeah. put money into that, Stephen. <laughs> but it's, it's, it, I mean, it, you know, they, they win both ways. The rich win both ways. Look, mm. if if the market, the so-called market, is rising, you know, which means prices are going up for stocks and derivatives, mm. all these all these things, these fictitious bits of paper or debts that that people want to buy people, they're not people, they're institutions of the rich, that these people can buy and want to buy, if the price is going up, they know that they can make money from buying it now and selling it tomorrow. Mm. If they know the price is going down, they do the opposite. They sell, and this, this is what's called shorting and what became one of the issues, and is, you know, is, is that they um and are whether or not they'll make it illegal and whatever. What you can do is you can sell it now even though you don't own it, and buy it, later. and buy it later at the lower price, and pass it on to the person you've already sold it to, <laughs> and make a profit. So they can make a profit going both ways, whether it's going up or going down. And the consequence, that is monkey. The, the consequence <laughs> that is, is this: it, it's not just fictitious money. It actually comes back to someone, you know, ordinary working class people's lives, mm. because that loss then comes out of your pension scheme, or it comes out of the NHS, or it comes out of the health budget or it comes out of somebody's wages and a firm goes bust and someone loses a job it eventually comes home to ordinary people mm-hmm. and they're the ones who genuinely pay the price for something that's going on that they've got no control over and is done to them by mm-hmm. those who have power and, and, and wealth what 
it's an absolute dirty, dirty, man. dirty yeah, witty, well, witty, 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 witty. That's why it's got a different language, and that's why it's <clears throat> ordinary working class people can't understand this stuff. Mm-hmm. Of course, they bloody can. They can they can tell a robbery when it's going on, mm. and you've got to invent this whole language to hide it, mm. to disguise what's really going on, and that's what. That's partly the role of economics, it's partly what finance is about, banking, you know, all of that's about, is hiding what's really happening. See, my level of understanding of economics is... Are you going to say the same? <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to say? <laughs> I was going to make a joke about my level of a, a, my idea behind stocks. My whole knowledge comes from playing Grand Theft Auto V. <laughs> 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 I wasn't going to be that dumb. But <laughs> it was a joke. I was going to make right, a joke. Right, a to- that's not a joke. But it's genuinely, pretty much. My, under- <laughs> my entire understanding of economics is essentially that if the rich have too much money, that it's not getting spent in the economy. Mm. And if the poor have money, it's mm. all going to get spent. Mm. That's the limit of my understanding. But that seems to be enough for me. Yeah, yeah, that, that's true. That's all true. Uh, the question I have, which again, starts to open up a can of worms, is where did the rich get their money in the first place? From the poor. Yeah. Mm. And how did they get it from the poor? Well, they either stole it, you know, so you had the highland clearances, you know, you had slavery, you know, whatever, with a simple theft. And, I mean, you know, look at what's happening in the property market in London. All these Russians, Russian oligarchs or Chinese billionaires have bought up all these mansions and God knows whatever they've bought up. Where did the money come from that? I mean, look at look at the owner of Chelsea. How old is Abramovich? He's what, in his forties, maybe? I've no idea. I, mean, I have no idea either. <laughs> Somebody can Google it, but yeah, you know, he ain't very old. And how on earth did he mass amass the amount of money he's got to be able to buy a football club? <laughs> well, <laughs> this is you, they don't you know they don't this come is to, also to a penny. Is that when we're talking about <laughs> my level of economic knowledge? What I've just said that I know also it's kind of obvious that when the poor people spend money it's automatically going to the rich anyway so there's a problem there already. Yeah. Is, yeah. I, I don't know how to get away from that. It's always going to be hoarded. Is there a way to stop it being hoarded? Yeah. Well, you Tax do, them. You, well <clears throat> you, that's the immediate thing. So you you can have what's referred to as progressive taxation. In other words, the the poor you are, the less you pay. The richer you are, the more you pay. But you can't just tax income. They've got their wealth in in property and land and whatever. So you've got to tax their land, and they've also got their their wealth in stashed in other things like stock shares and Panama bank accounts, or whatever. So you've got to tax their wealth that's mobile. So through com- through things like companies, because you know. The, they get their money either, like I was saying, through theft or through exploiting ordinary working people. So the reason why um, you know Philip Green can sell, can walk away from British home stores going bust is because he's exploited the workforce in British home stores, paying them uh, low wages in order to boost the the money that he can then extract out of the company, even though the company is apparently making a loss. It doesn't stop him taking tens, hundreds of millions of pounds out of the company and walking off into the sunset with it. So mm. the rich are rich because they exploit the poor. They don't. The rich aren't rich because of their own effort, and their own wealth and their own activity. It's because they're able to exploit those who genuinely create wealth, which is ordinary working people. So value comes from the production of goods, the effort that you, me and others put in. So this podcast... Okay, this podcast is being created by the three of us sitting around a room. Mm. That's the value. The value of this podcast is what we've put into it. If us three stop speaking for the next thirty minutes, there's no podcast. Mm. There's so probably more it. views, <laughs> possibly. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, so the value comes out of ordinary people, and it's the the theft of that value that allows the rich to gain money. So, again, this podcast, it's either worth nothing because no, we don't sell it, it's just given away to everybody, mm. okay? Or it's packaged up into a product called a podcast and you can sell it to somebody. Now, you can sell it to somebody probably for not a lot, 
if this, if if I was a Beyonce or God knows who, mm. this podcast would then be worth a packet to whoever you sell it to, the record yeah. company or something, who would then make a killing out of it. Mm. Unfortunately, you've got me, so it's worth nothing. So that's <laughs> <tough>. <laughs> but it's still the value that's created by the people who do the work, create the wealth, and what's happening is we have a system which steals that, takes surplus value, takes the value out of it, and pays a wage to those who produce a low wage and the real value the wealth that's really created is concentrated in those who have the power to do that well now due to this conversation something's just clicked I've had a click you've got a click you I click. had a click I've been watching Parliament Live a lot lately as you know mm. I like to yeah. I like to sit down and hear my Vimto and watch Parliament Live I just hear I usually hear just screaming posh men as a go past <laughs> <Aye>. <laughs> <laughs> or me shouting fuck because they've annoyed me uh, and I hear a lot about uh, when they're talking about tax and different things they're talking about they want to lower those taxes because it helps the poor but the way you're speaking is that the poor didn't have land they didn't have big uh, houses they didn't have investment in stock they don't have multiple houses they don't have hidden away funds in Panama they're not hurting yeah. the poor at all they're just then they want to hurt their pals yeah absolutely bastards <laughs> oh, see I hate life <laughs> this this annoys me see how could you learn about this and not constantly walk about going fucking cunt fuck, fuck, bastards because that's what you do unless you get organised mm. getting organised in a political party in a trade union in a campaign starts to make you realise you don't just sit there swearing at the telly. I do it as well. You know, <laughs> we all do it. But it means you can begin to change things. And when we, when we organise together, when we resist together and fight back, we begin to make changes. So, you know, the change in society doesn't come out of nowhere. It doesn't come from the rich being nice and benevolent and saying, oh, the poor, poor people, let's give them something. Mm. It's taken off of them. Because they will continue to take as much as they can for as long as they can get away with it. And that's what class struggle is about. And that's why, that's why I'm, like I said earlier, I'm in my union, I'm on the National Executive, I'm in a political party, I'm also an academic. So I'm interested in how we organise and how we as working class people start to take control of our lives. Yeah. First of all, we've got to understand what's happening in our <clears> lives. And B, we have to begin to think about how we alter that. And that requires collective organisation. And I think that's one of the key lessons that's coming out of all of the movements globally. You know, whether, whether or not it's the independence referendum you know, last year, whether or not it's the, the movement in Greece around Syriza, whether or not it's, look at what's happening in, in America with Bernie Saunders. You know, in, the Amer in American society, that society is polarising because there's a huge section of the population are beginning to realise and understand what is happening in, mm. in their society, in American society. And that's true, that's true globally. That's true mm. everywhere. That's it. And the more that people are aware of that, the more they resist it and challenge it, the more things change. This, this is what I think um, the information age, obviously, with the internet and everything, it's a lot easier for people to kind of check up on this stuff a lot of the time. Yeah. And I think uh, in days gone past... It was harder for a lot of people to kind of check up on stuff, and I, I know there was kind of like uh, debates and stuff still happening on TV and stuff like that. But there was still kind of inside knowledge you had to gain. I would imagine. I mean, there wasn't stuff. even the cameras inside Westminster are relatively no. recent as well. Well, that's only you got live was, streaming into the Parliament. It's like constantly. So I can't remember what year it was. They got cameras. I'm sure it was like the early nineties or something like that. I'm sure. Well, it's been some time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not quite sure when, but it's, it's still relatively recent compared to uh, some other things. So, and I, I, I think it's it's great that some people are actually paying attention now that they can actually yeah. get stuff sorted. And I, I'd love to have seen what was happening in Westminster when no one was watching. Uh. because now you see them trying to be relatively realistic, but when nobody's watching. Mm -hmm. Have you seen Parliament Live's already a circus? If no one's watching them, I would love to have seen how mental it was. Mm. Then, 
Well, I, I did go once. I mean, I've been to Parliament once or twice. But there was once I went before it was um, televised. And I was there for one evening. You know, it doesn't matter why. But anyway, I popped into the um, uh, viewing gallery because the public can go. And it was, it was one evening. And I was sitting there for not long, about half an hour. And I was bored, stupid. I thought, <laughs> this is just dull. It really is dull. Anyway, there were a couple of people in front of me. I don't know who they were. Talking, uh, and I was overhearing them going this is so exciting did you hear that and blah 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 I thought, am I hearing the same thing as you are because <laughs> this is dull <laughs> anyway I get home and put on the news nine, ten o'clock news whatever it was and there was this big article on the news the first time or whatever it was about this big round that had gone on in parliament I, thought, I was sitting there listening to this <laughs> I didn't think that's what happened so you thought did it was it better worse before cameras uh, I don't think it was made much difference it's the past of aggression in yeah. Parliament that gets me oh, yeah. Yeah. it's yeah. really it's really painful to watch it cringe worthy sometimes mm. we, what was it we were watching we were watching uh, David Cameron uh, David Cameron David Cameron sweating over the pan the panel oh aye, aye. Yeah, yeah, yeah. aye. we were yeah. watching no, the, the dodgy Dave the, who was that guy oh when uh, Dennis Skinner got picked Dennis Skinner yeah Great, great. Good on you. <laughs> I think, though, what annoys me, though, is that he asked a pretty decent question. And because he wouldn't have retract that dodgy Dave bit, it didn't need to be answered. Oh, yeah. And I would have quite liked to hear David Cameron's answer. He would have snaked his way at it somehow, but it would have been good to just at least have the question answered. That, that's, uh, that's a downside to Dennis Skinner's legendary status, mm. is that he sometimes doesn't get his questions answered. But I, There's a lot of kind of traditions, I feel like, in the... the and the kind of situations that are like could be gone, like all this kind of was it like right honourable and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Like mm -hmm. you, you could be doing without that a lot of the time. It's a lot of kind of wasted time trying to memorise all this. Yeah. Dumb Peter care. Grant was talking about this one day. He was saying that there was, I think, there was three votes in the House of Commons, and it took them about three hours. He said in the Scottish Parliament, it would take three minutes mm. because it's all computerised. It's just. Mm. There's no point in taking three years to do three votes. I mean, it's just nothing's getting done then, it's taking forever. That's it. Mm. Well, let's get back to your kind of line of work. There's <laughs> bound to be people that are uh, completely disagree with the way you kind of see things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you said you're a, a minority. Yeah. Among. Yeah, yeah. Uh. Well, academics are by and large fairly liberal groups. Um, but certainly in terms of Marxist economists, yeah, they're a small minority. Mm -hmm. um, and the discipline of economics is going through quite a transition at the moment so it is and, and has been for a long time dominated by a very narrow set of ideas sort of neo, what's referred to as neoliberalism um, as a, a, an academic set of, of ideas that is starting to open up and it's opening up because students themselves are resistant to it uh, mm -hmm. They're demanding what they what's referred to as heterodox or pluralist ideas, so alternative approaches. That's starting to emerge. Lecturers themselves are fed up with not introducing more pluralist ideas, and also the the um, world economy with the crash created a massive problem in terms of explaining what had happened and the discipline of economics had mm -hmm. largely failed to come up with cogent answers and sensible answers about why that happened and what the consequences of it are. So economics as a discipline is actually quite an interesting place to be at the minute because there are some pretty big transitions going on. Now they're not, you, know, they, you often don't see them, mm. but underneath, you know, if, if you're involved in that, then you can see how people are beginning to question. And more radical politics and, and economics are starting to come into the system much more than 10 years ago. So it's, mm. it's quite interesting, you know, intellectually, in that sense. It's good. So w when you're lecturing, uh, do you get like you know, like socialist kind of uh, idealised students, and like d different kind of like cap more capitalist based guys and stuff like that? Um, a lot of the time. You you do yeah you mm. you get a range. So students have you know students have a range of different political ideas and different economic ideas. One of the things, I mean, I, and I don't go around forcing my ideas down people's throats. But that was going to be my. Um, I don't think thing. you should do that as, a, no. as an academic. I think what you should do is present different ideas and let students themselves come up with a, their own interpretation, their own understanding. What I what I do 
argue with the students a lot, and it becomes it's becoming more and more important, is that they do have to recognise where they, these ideas come from and what the implications of their ideas are. And they do have to recognise they've got opinions and views and they need to express them and demonstrate what their views are and back it up with some sort of theory, some sort of ideas. Um, and they need to be much more explicit because one of the things I think students do a lot is that they're reluctant to come to a view. They're reluctant to say what they think. Partly because they think they're being marked, they're being judged, and they are. Mm. But actually, I think what matters more is people are capable of defending their view and presenting an argument in a piece of work or whatever. Um, and I think they should get respected for that and um, mm -hmm. and supported in doing that. And that, I think, is something that students have to learn to do. And it's partly because they've unlearned how to do it. It goes back to what you were saying right at the beginning about can people understand economics? Well, mm -hmm. I think they can easily, and they do easily. But if you've got into, gone through school, passed exams and this, that and the other, and then got into university and passed more exams, one thing you're good at is passing exams. Mm -hmm. And that's not the same as conducting an argument and convincing somebody of, of what your view is. Yep. And so in a sense they've unlearned how to do that and instead they've learned how to go through this system called education. Mm. But actually they need to, in a sense, go back to what they originally knew or, or rediscover and re-identify re re what it is they, they know and how to, how to convince somebody of, of a particular point of view. And, do you come across that quite a lot then? Yeah, 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 oh. yeah. 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 And that's, that's quite a struggle for students. Yeah. Because they're, you know, they're focused on how do I pass this exam and get on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. Stop asking me to make an argument and convince somebody. I'm not interested in convincing anybody of anything. I just want to pass this exam, yeah. and that's that's the system they're in pushes them into doing that. Mm -hmm. When me and uh, I used to do another podcast called Develop Skeptics, and uh, we used to speak about it a lot that the people that you really wanted to have ideas and to promote them in, in a public space are generally the ones that didn't want to put their, pop, their opinions in a public place whereas the people who haven't thought about their opinions much are the ones that want to shout the loudest about their opinions and that seems to be <laughs> a terribly cynical way of putting it there might be some truth in it <laughs> but it seems to it seems to be well, I don't know if it's always true but it seems to be what happens a lot especially in like the hip hop community Mm. Is that a lot of people will just blot it, just right, ed, just right. anything. Just they don't need to think about it for too long. They'll just ugh. yeah, yeah. And uh, if you try and put forward a a rational, you take a bit for this side and a bit for this side, and you sort of put it together and try and come up with a rational idea, people will just dismiss it straight away. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, the, the, I mean that's very common in the in social media. If people yeah. on Twitter or on Facebook or whatever can can rant without really they can say what they want without actually thinking is it what I actually do think mm. and that's why you get the you, know, you, you get the kind of nonsense around trolling or whatever but equally I don't think people are stupid um, and I think it take again the example I'll pick is the independence referendum no one no one would say that the, in the independence referendum people weren't engaged and didn't mm. understand what the issues were and and just couldn't understand all these complexities about independence. They did. Whether or not you were yes or no, people had a very deep-rooted understanding of what the questions were about and what their views were and why they held the views they had. Mm. And that engagement tells you, or tells me, that ordinary working people are clearly capable of running their lives, running society and having a view and having making judgments on things in a completely rational way if they're given an opportunity to and what what the problem is is 99% of their lives they're not given the opportunity to do you think that some of the people that were heavily involved in the independence movement have sort of stepped a wee bit back from politics now do you think there's been a even I've noticed that there's a, a few people yeah, yeah. there are people that during the referendum were strong yes they were just constantly talking about it and then after the no vote they just seem to 
It's quite quiet. I mean, there's still a small group mm. that are still heavily yes. And I, just, I do think that if another referendum comes, I think it would be a bit more, a bit higher, I would mm-hmm. assume. But it does seem that some people have got bored after talking about politics for so long. They've just sort of um, I'll, I'll be careful of that. I mean, I, I think it's certainly true that the, that the numbers of people who are going to be involved in official politics will be much lower now than a year ago. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm guessing... The EU referendum, the turnout's going to be nowhere near what yeah. it was for the uh, independence referendum. I'm guessing that next week's um, parliamentary election in Scotland, the turnout's going to be nowhere near what it was for the, EU re- the independence referendum. But I don't think that means people are disengaged. I think they've, you know, they might not be turning up to a public meeting or turning up to a demonstration or whatever, it, whatever measure you want to pick. But that doesn't mean people have forgotten or don't care. Mm. It's one of the things I think is is emerging is that Parliament is becoming the most important place where politics is understood to take place rather than in the communities, in the streets, in workplaces, Mm. which is where it was a year ago. People would talk about the the conversation you had while waiting for the bus or the conversation you had in the canteen or or whatever. These conversations were going on everywhere. Now that's... The idea is that that's being removed, and conversations are now taking place only in one place, which is this place called Parliament. Mm. And I disagree with that. I think, you know, politics, these conversations, the ideas, are about ordinary people taking control of every part of their lives, wherever yeah. that happens to be. That was probably one of my favourite parts about the independence referendum was being because before this, I was talking a lot about it wasn't politics in the same way as I'm talking about it now. But it was like ideas, it was political ideas, it was yeah. opinions on certain things. Uh, so I was talking about that for a while and being told to shut up because I was boring. And then suddenly sitting in the bar where somebody's asking me if I'm a yes man or a no man. <laughs> and I'm like, ha! <laughs> Tales of turning yeah, down! Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, that, I, I really enjoyed that. But, uh, yeah. Uh, Excellent. So uh, are you got anything you want, to, you, want, you want us to cover before we go? Um, well... Appeal to everybody to get involved, um, fight for change, come together, join a union, get involved in politics, get involved in a community campaign. All of these things make a difference, and part of the, part of what people need to do to do that is they also need to understand ideas and debate ideas. Mm-hmm. So economics is part of it, but if economics isn't your bag, well, I might as well say more questions. Well, on you go, on you go. Uh, so, where do you stand on EU? Because there, there's, there was, I don't know if you've seen it, but apparently on Question Time, an economist said that if we leave the EU within a certain amount of years, we'll have paid back the national debt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I, don't, I don't know if I fully buy that. No. I mean, right, what do I think? I, th- I, th- I think the EU referendum is a disgrace in terms of the two campaigns are basically campaigning on I'm more racist than you are. <laughs> you know, that's their appeal to the vote for the vote and I think it's disgusting because I think refugees immigration asylum has got nothing to do with with um, the issue around the EU I'm in favour of, of people being able to move so I'm in favour of people coming from the camps in Calais into Britain and of migrants fleeing war that's the cause of our government so what I think is you know, I don't want to have anything to do with the two official campaigns because they're just thoroughly racist in terms of the EU itself I don't think we should have illusions that the European Union will bring about change I think the European Union is part of the the institutions in society that are driving through austerity and driving through cuts in welfare Um, so you only have to look at what happened in Greece last year um, where the, the European Union destroyed an economy and impoverished the people a whole population in order to drive down um, drive down their living standards so I'm in favour of getting out of the EU but I want nothing to do with the racists and I think we should do it on, on the basis that if we want to challenge austerity, if we want to fight against austerity, we have to f- come together as a working class and we have to have a class conflict against our rulers and also the institutions that they represent and the EU is part of that 
So I'm in favour of getting so you out. You support the, the Lexit campaign. Yeah, so I'm part of the Lexit mm-hmm. campaign. That's right. That's right. Which is going to be small, and he's going to have a small voice. But I think it's important because whichever way the referendum goes, the the right wing, the Tories, whichever version of it, are going to intensify the the austerity agenda. That's where they're going, and we've got to fight that. I think uh, a lot of people that voted yes are in- instinctively going for the EU as well. I know the Greens are supporting the EU and the SNP support the EU. Yeah. I think I don't know if Rise. Do you know if Rise are Um the Rise are more ambivalent. Some are for and some against. I'm not sure if they've right. taken an official position. Solidarity has taken a position of of exit. Yeah, they mm. seem to be the only left party well, that so, I know well, that. Socialist Workers official. Party is part of the Lexit campaign. Right. Um, but it's a, it's a much smaller grouping, yeah. Mm. And I think it's because it comes back to what I said earlier about politics being seen to be in Parliament. Part of what's happening is you've got a, you've got to focus on parliamentary politics and institutions, in this case government, bringing about reforms for us. And that's why people who would have been previously critical of the EU, like the Greens and, and like um, Corbyn and the Pai now are increasingly focused on can you get change through Parliament and if you can't get it through your Westminster Parliament or the Scottish Parliament, can you get it through a different Parliament, in this case the EU whereas I don't think change comes through Parliament change comes through ordinary working people fighting back and forcing reforms I think, I've seen a few people claiming that uh, Jeremy Corbyn secretly wants to leave the EU but he can't say it because he's leader of the Labour Party which is for the EU don't know if I buy that don't know if that's you should ask him. <laughs> he <laughs> certainly was. I mean, the, 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 tradition, the position of the left in the 1970s and 80s was that the EU institutions are about the institutions of capitalism and therefore we should try and resist them and stop them and exit the EU as part of that. Um, and I think, I mean, again, you know, think, think of what would happen if Corbyn had come out against the EU and if the EU referendum goes against Cameron... Cameron will be finished. He'd have to resign, or his government would be finished. That would be a massive victory for everybody. Yeah, I think a lot of people were saying that's why Ian Duncan Smith resigned. So he's trying to get in place again. He's trying to fight against Cameron for yeah. leadership and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, they're, they're all lining each other up for whoever's going to be the next Tory party um, leader. He's already been the leader. Yeah, well, Boris, John, um, Boris Johnson is, is clearly the one who wants it. Mm. Mm. Aye. Uh, the final thing is a. Uh, I know a lot of socialists like to talk about how they're going to create lots of jobs and stuff, and but we've also noticed an increase in automated jobs. That if you work at McDonald's, yeah. they've got in America they've got the create your own burger machines and those self checkout things. Do you think the economy is going to struggle with an increase in? Robotics and AI technology that's going to do all these jobs for free and then it's going to leave a lot of people jobless and so therefore poor people having less money to spend in the economy and then... Um, no, no is a simple answer because two things. One is somebody's got to make these robots. Robots don't make themselves. Um, so there's always dynamic change in economies. Um, so, you know... 20, well, 30 years ago, we wouldn't be sitting here. The biggest employer here was the pit. Mm. 30 years later, mm. we're sitting here with technology doing something different. Jobs always change, and capitalism is dynamic in that sense. And it overthrows old technologies and brings in new technologies. And that means jobs do change. And, of course, for employers, that means can you make the working class people pay for that by unemployment and the rest and low wages. But... Ultimately, whenever a new technology comes in, there's new work and new labour required to make that technology work. So, you know, what I was saying earlier, all value, all value comes from labour power. It comes from ordinary people. So, yeah, you can make your own burger in McDonald's. Well, I presume you can. I've not been into one, but <laughs> take your, assume you're right. mostly America. <laughs> I'll, I'll take your word for it. But who on earth puts the burgers in the back of the machine? 
You've no. got to have somebody in the back who fills up the burger machine. Oh, no, no, the, the machine yeah. is just a computer. You press, see what I want. Yeah, well, I'm sure you do, yeah. And then someone else goes and makes it. Exactly. Uh, that's exactly. Like. So, so in other words, and that's been true in, in, um, in Tesco's and the retail sector. All of the, the new technology that's coming that's got rid of frontline staff in the tills and whatever, there's far more jobs being created in the background staff because they've got to count the money, they've got to do all the other admin and whatever. Mm. So you displace jobs in one area, but then you recreate a whole back bunch of new jobs in another area. So, you know, Amazon is a case in point. You don't have a store to go and buy something from Amazon, you do it over the web. Well, you, that means you've now got a fleet of people driving around vans delivering. You've got a whole stack of people in these warehouses packing. So you've just dis removed jobs in one area and created a whole stack of another. What's mm. the issue? What's a class question? is what's the quality and the pay and the conditions of those jobs? If it's low-paid, hourly-paid, casual work, that's just a way of driving up the exploitation. Mm. If it's higher-paid, better-quality work, well, that's, that's going to benefit working-class people's living standards. And that's, that's what, so it's not, you know, I'm in, in favour of technology in general. The issue is not the technology, it's how it's used. And that requires ordinary people to have control over the use of that technology. That's what really matters. Quality. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excellent. I have any more questions? So no, that's, that's me. That's me. Well, well okay. cheers for coming on. That's good. I've that's enjoyed good it. Good chat. Definitely, man. Thanks for that.